Chicago, a special place for teaching and learning dialogue and prayer and service located here on the banks of the beautiful and majestic Lake Michigan. My name is Michael Murphy and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. And on behalf of our Hank Center staff, office manager, Katie Arnold, uh, graduate assistant, Adam High, and undergraduate intern, Mary Countryman, and on behalf of Joan and Bill Hank and their family, whose generous endowment funds our many endeavors, I welcome you to our annual Terra de Chardin SJ Fellow in Catholic Studies lecture, a new kind of saint, Catholics and canonization in the 21st century, featuring Dr. Kathleen Scrose Cummings of the University of Notre Dame. It is such a delight to be together in person tonight, and I'm really am happy with the turnout. I was truly wondering, you know, what the physical turnout would be. Uh, this is just our third in-person gathering since the pandemic changed our lives in 2020. But since one of these events was a major gala celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Hank Center last spring, and the other one took place in Dallas a couple weeks ago, uh, it may as well be our first after a uh, too long of a drought. Uh, still, we have not left the Zoom world behind. In fact, we have close to 700 people uh, joining us through the wonders of Zoom and digital technology. So hello, uh, Zoom people. Um, we thank our engineer, Sam Sorich, back in the corner, along with Rick Fazzo and our uh, Loyola IT team, a Cracker Jack team, for making all this possible. So again, welcome uh, one and all in person, in the flesh, and, uh, and online. And uh, we're glad you're here. The Pierre uh, Teilhard de Chardin SJ Fellowship in Catholic Studies is a visiting fellowship in the fall semester for invited scholars from across the disciplines uh, and from around the world whose work intersects with the rich intellectual, artistic, and historical tradition of Roman Catholicism. You know, a quick aside here, uh, I'm so glad our 2020 Teilhard Fellow, Dr. Steve Millies, is in the house. Hello, Steve. Welcome yeah. back, my friend. Steve's also a Loyola grad, a rambler, so that's another little level here. Uh, and I'm, I know that uh, Father Steve Schlesser, another Steve, is, is zooming in from Fordham, where Father Schlesser is on um, a, a fellowship of his own, away from his home base. Um, I also want to welcome Dr. Brad Hunt, uh, uh, Chair of History, who, without Brad, uh, Brad is co-hosting Kathy uh, and her fellowship here. So good to see you, Dr. Hunt, and thank you for being here. About Tayar, just a little bit about him. Uh, he's not often the, the, the precise uh, topic of our yearly lectures, uh, his, but his intellect and imagination inspired them in fundamental ways. Um, you know, Teilhard was a scientist mystic, and you heard me, how does that work? A scientist mystic. And, uh, you know, he developed a philosophy that married the science of the material world with the sacred mysteries of Catholic theology, philosophy, and spirituality. Uh, neither though the, the Catholic Church nor the Scientific Academy often uh, agreed with his constructive speculations, especially in the mid-century, uh, mid-20th century. And as ever, we are reminded again that a prophet is rarely known in her own town or time. Uh, but as ever, time also teaches us things we are not readily, that things are not, that are not readily seen in the plane of their original existence somehow show up through the gift of time. Taylor's writings in that, in that spirit have been more lately received as prescient and prophetic even by a wide array of figures. Marshall McLuhan, Pope Benedict XVI, and the creators of the World Wide Web even. Taylor quite naturally and profoundly engaged his questions with all of the resources at his disposal, with all the resources of being and we think this is a good way to go. This kind of interdisciplinary attention and practice is a central hallmark of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Dr. Cummings' lecture draws on this Teardian spirit. To be sure, her whole approach to scholarship, teaching, and learning draws on this kind of interdisciplinarity that I just described, Teilhard's model of uh, encountering the real, encountering our lives, creation, uh, the interior world, the exterior world, is quite beautiful. She has this interdisciplinary, um, she's afflicted with them almost, you know, <laughs> the wide range. And I'll tell you, and for example, she's the William W. and Anna Jean Kushla director at the Kushla Center for the Study of American Catholicism and the Reverend John A. O'Brien College Professor of American Studies at Notre Dame. 
She's also a professor in the departments of American Studies and History at Notre Dame and an affiliated faculty member in Gender Studies, Italian Studies, and in the Nanopic Institute for European Studies. It's an amazing range. Uh, Dr. Cummings' most recent book, A Saint of Our Own, How the Quest for a Holy Hero Helped Catholics Become American, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in April 2019. At Notre Dame, Kathy teaches classes on the history of women, Catholicism, sanctity, and American religion. She also oversees the history of women religious, an academic organization devoted to the historical study of Catholic sisters. Professor Cummings often serves as a media commentator as well on contemporary events in the church and has a wide media presence on Catholic subjects. As Taylor Fellow at Loyola, uh, Professor Cummings is teaching a course in history, as I mentioned, it's a 300 level offering and it's called Sanctity and Society. There is always a great energy when I walk by that classroom. And I think all in the course are having a most memorable time, including Kathy, I dare say. So Kathy's lecture is about 45 minutes. After that, we'll have about 20 to 25 minutes of audience comment Q&A. And for those of you on Zoom, uh, please direct your questions or insights to Adam High, and then we'll integrate your questions as we can. So with all that, and thank you for hearing me out, it's important to set these things up properly. Uh, let's welcome our 2022 TR Fellow, Dr. Kathy Spose Cummings, a new kind of saint, Catholics and canonization in the 21st century. Hi, everybody, and hello to everybody on Zoom. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. I'm exceptionally grateful to Dr. Murphy, uh, Hank Center director and colleague extraordinaire for that introduction, and even more so for his warm hospitality for all he does to keep the Hank Center programming so vibrant and so vital to what happens here at Loyola University Chicago. Thanks also to the Hank Center's Katie Arnold for her help in organizing and to Sam on the technical side. Thanks to Brad Hunt and Michelle Nickerson and to many of my colleagues from the history department who are making me feel very much at home at Loyola Chicago this semester. Should I talk? I thought this was on. It is. Okay, okay. Um, most of all, thanks to my students in Sanctity and Society Seminar. Many of them are here tonight, and it, so far it has just been an amazing semester, and you'll be able to see some of what we've been learning together, and we have far more to come. We're half, only halfway done. I'm really honored to share my research on Catholic sanctity in the American historical memory, in American historical memory, and in our national landscape under the auspices of this distinguished lecture series. In Dan Simmons's Hyperion Cantos, four novels published between 1989 and 1987 and set in the far future, Teilhard de Chardin has been canonized a saint, and his story inspires the priest protagonist, Paul Duray. When, later in the series of novels, Duray is elevated to the papacy, he takes the name Pope Teilhard. That moment, it's safe to say, remains in the far future. Um, though in our present, Teilhard is often considered a saintly figure and has been since shortly after his death in 1955. As Thomas M. King has argued by the opening of the Second Vatican Council 60 years ago yesterday, Teilhard had come to be regarded as a saint for the times. Though as King writes, Teilhard's sanctity was unusual in that it showed itself chiefly in a dedication to the world and to secular work. Through canonization, the church affirms that a person having lived a life of heroic virtue passed immediately into God's eternal presence at the moment of death. And yet, if saints are timeless in that sense, they are also time-bound, as King's characterization of Teilhard as a saint for the time suggests. One of the most arresting expressions of the belief that new moments demand new saints and the inspiration for my title tonight comes from Simone Weil, who in a letter to her friend, Per Perrin, in May 1942, observed that, we are living in times which have no precedent. Today, it is not nearly enough to be a saint, but we must have the saintliness demanded by the present moment, a new saintliness, itself also without precedent. Now, I am neither a novelist like Simmons nor a philosopher like Vey. I am a historian of the United States, and as such, I am more circumscribed when it comes to sanctity by evidence and by precedent. 
Nevertheless, there is ample room for imagination and historical work. Life would be very boring if there was not. And I think that saints lend themselves particularly well to creative work in the historical imagination. Canonization may be fundamentally about holiness, but it's never only about holiness. It's often about what captures the imagination in particular times and places. So this evening, I invite all of you to use the words of the historian of early modern Europe, Simon Ditchfield, to think with the saints as we consider how Catholic holiness intersects with American history and contemporary culture in this moment in particular. I will say more later about this mural uh, painted by a high school student in Ohio in 2019. But for now, I just want to mention that it captures some of the themes I want to highlight tonight. First of all, it shows that the Catholic saints we celebrate are tied to the American stories we want to tell. It depicts canonization as a dynamic process that entails the perpetual reinvention of saints and saints in the making in ways that enlarge and expand our stories. And finally, it underscores that if we want to predict the saints of the future, we need to pay attention to what the faithful are saying in the United States today about saints and saints in the making. What they're saying in written and visual texts and in what seem unlikely places and even in new media. Though I have an American frame, it's important to be mindful that canonization is an ecclesial process. We can talk about that at the very end. Um, it's an elaborate series of steps in place since the 16th century with only minor modifications. And on that note, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, for a moment, if I can advance my slide here, uh, a, a, a person who became a dear friend of mine and a person I've learned a great deal from, Father Peter Gumpel, a Jesuit who died yesterday in Rome at the age of 98, almost 99. Peter Gumpel was an absolutely brilliant historian and unfailingly gracious person who worked for over 60 years at the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints. In an interview with Ken Woodward in 1987, Father Gumpel had this to say about the complexities of the canonization process. I am not generally considered to be stupid, Gumpel observed. That's the understatement of the century. But it took me six or seven years working at the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints before he became to understand the whole business. If I have come to understand it at all, it's largely because of him. As one of the few English speakers at the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, um, Father Gumpel worked on many of the causes that I wrote about, including Catherine Drexel, who I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and um, so, of course, I was very nervous. Um, he had also gone on record with Ken Woodward saying that in his experience, very few Americans understood canonization. So I was, un I was very nervous when I met with him in June of 2019 at his home in Rome, um, and he had read my book and was eager to discuss it with me. Um, he was gracious on that occasion, as he always was. So I just like to um, really to just honor him and thank him for, for all that, that he did. Now, it is not only American saints like Catherine Drexel and some of the others I'll talk about who have the power to, under, to help to teach us something about this American moment. So I want to start with the saint whose feast the Universal Church marks today. With apologies to any Neds or Teds in the audience, um, it's fair to say that the Feast of St. Edward is not celebrated particularly widely in the United States, certainly not in comparison to England, uh, where Edward was king between uh, 1042 and 1066. It is celebrated there in the Catholic Church and in the Church of um, England. Westminster Abbey, in fact, dedicates today through Sunday as Edward Tide. And yet St. Edward has historically carried a lot of weight in one corner of the United States, specifically my home institution, the University of Notre Dame. Founded in 1842 by Edward Soren, a member of the French Congregation of Holy Cross, Soren instituted an annual celebration of Founders Day on his name day. Writing to his confreres, he said, I bless God that I was not baptized under a French saint's name. What makes my English St. Edward's Feast so pleasant to all of us is the total absence of every vestige of nationality. So conscious was Soren of America's bias against Catholic and particularly Irish Catholic immigrants throughout Notre Dame's founding period that there is some evidence he actually forbade any special celebration of St. Patrick's Day. 
Now, ultimately, Soren was fighting a losing battle on that front. But at least until he died in, 19, in 1893, October 13th, Founders Day, outshone March 17th as an occasion for campus frivolity. Celebrations of Founders Day fell out of favor in the 20th century, but, 20th century, but were revived just a few years ago for a purpose that, like their 19th century iterations, had nothing to do with the life of an 11th century English king and quite a bit to do with the contemporary American context. Coincidentally, this revival was tied to another Americanizing impulse of Edward Soren. Between 1882 and 1884, Soren commissioned Luigi Gregori, a former artist of the papal household of Pius IX, to paint a series of murals on the then brand new main building, the one with the Golden Dome, depicting scenes from the life of Christopher Columbus. Like St. Edward, Columbus helped Soren in his quest to weave Catholicism more seamlessly into the American fabric. Soren himself was the model for Columbus in this slide. Um, let me, now there's nothing terribly objectionable about this mural, but most of the others in the series depict indigenous people in a manner that is both historically inaccurate and cultur culturally insensitive. Calls for the removal of the murals began at Notre Dame in the 1970s with the enrollment of the first Native American students. Um, the protests against them began in earnest in the 1990s, and for decades, Notre Dame's administration resisted removal, pointing out that these were frescoes painted directly on the wall, impossible to move without destroying. That changed rather abruptly on January 20th, 2019, not coincidentally, the feast of Blessed Basil Moreau, the, the founder of the Congregation of Holy Cross, and also that year, the eve of Martin Luther King Day. Notre Dame's president, Father John Jenkins, issued a letter to the community stating, quote, the murals reflect the attitudes of the time and were intended as a didactic presentation responding to cultural challenges for the school's largely immigrant Catholic population. In recent years, however, many have come to see the murals as at best blind to the consequences of Columbus's voyage for indigenous peoples who inhabited this new world and at worst demeaning toward them. He went on to announce that the murals would be covered with elaborate tapestries, which could be removed periodically to accommodate classroom visits. And he also promised that more learning opportunities were on the way, including this one, which was announced a few weeks later. Founders Day. And you can see here, this talked about a, a holiday that used to be celebrated, but that was going to be celebrated once again as a way to understand more about history and to take a deeper look at Notre Dame's history so as to understand our present and future. Convenient timing, of course, October 13th is always close to Columbus Day. Now, of course, Columbus is a contentious hero throughout the nation as this past Monday has been renamed Indigenous Peoples Day in many municipalities. Notre Dame, in fact, is not the only place that has replaced the day that used to honor Columbus a day with a day designated to honor another Catholic saint. In March of 2020, the state of Colorado passed a bill designating the first Monday in October as Francis Xavier Cabrini Day, a paid state holiday that would substitute for the one that has, has, had historically been observed on the second Monday in October. Incidentally, this made Colorado the first state, uh, first state to create a paid holiday named after a woman. This past Monday, a uh, theologian for, at Manhattan College in New York uh, issued this tweet suggesting that the Knights of Columbus, founded in the early 1880s, rename um, themselves the Knights of Mother Cabrini. Now, I did not include screenshots of the responses that this evoked, but you, I'll just let you imagine them. Um, and some of them actually suggested that Columbus's cause for canonization should be open, which I don't think is is gonna gain much traction. Now on Ahern's tweet here, he includes a capsule of this Cabrini statue that was dedicated in New York City on Columbus Day two years ago. It had come about as a result of a city campaign called She Built NYC, um, designed to put more women in the landscape. The impulse to retell saintly stories to reflect new moments is absolutely intertwined with the secular project currently underway, namely the reimagining of our national public landscape. 
projects like She Built NYC are replicated in cities throughout the United States. And at the federal level, with initiatives such as this one, led by the Honorable Rosie Rios, 43rd Treasurer of the United States. Treasurer Rios describes her awakening when she walked into the Treasury her first day in 2008 and noticed that there were no women on the currency and no women's portraits. And she led, initiated an effort to place a woman on the front of US currency for the first time. And her current work at Harvard University is designed to help women become more integrated into classrooms and in public spaces. The Mellon Foundation is currently devoting millions of dollars to support its Monuments Project, a multi-pronged effort, effort to transform the commemorative landscape of the United States. From their website, monuments and, more, and memorials are how a country tells and teaches its story. What story does the commemorative landscape of the United States tell? Who are we instructed to honor and uplift? And who do we not see in these potent symbols? To answer these questions, Mellon sponsored a national monument audit through Philadelphia's Monument Lab. This is how it defined monument and a little bit about its methodology. I really encourage you to look it up. It's, you can spend lots of time kind of parsing it out. It's really interesting. Um, but a monument lab defined a monument as a statement of power and presence in public. Its number one finding, you can probably guess this, is that the majority of monuments in the United States are overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. They produce this stunning visual to kind of drive home this point. And again, I have a link to it here, but you can Google it in National Monument Audit. There's all sorts of things you can find out about this. Now, the first four are not particularly surprising. There's Columbus at number three, Martin Luther King right next to him, the only other person to have a federal holiday named after him, after our numbers one and two were morphed into President's Day. Look at number five, St. Francis of Assisi. As Patricia Applebaum shows in her book, St. Francis of America, St. Francis's popularity in the United States is owed more to Protestants than it is to Catholics. As a pre-Reformation figure, Protestants could claim Francis as part of their history, which they began to do in the late 19th century, as travel to Europe became more accessible and as they were exposed to European art and architecture. A railway to Assisi was built in 1866, so increasing their familiarity with Francis. Also contributing to Francis's popularity in the 19th century and since was the way Americans in that period began to idealize the natural world. And he was seen as a person, a saint for the natural world. Now notice, you probably already have, that there are only three women in the top 50. We have to go all the way to number 18 to find a woman. But when we do, it's a Catholic saint. St. Joan of Arc comes in at number 18. Harriet Tubman and Sacagawea are 24 and 28, respectively. Joan's high ranking is owed probably to another finding of the monument audit, namely that the most common features of American monuments reflect war and conquest. Joan lived in the 15th century, but she emerged as a nationalist hero after the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, and nationalism and sanctity were fused in her cause for canonization, which gained momentum in the decades leading up to the Great War, and it was completed, um, her canonization, she was canonized in 1920. My immediate predecessor as a Teilhard Fellow, Steve Schlesser, is teaching about Joan in French culture um, at Fordham this semester. Now, across the Atlantic, U.S. Catholics also embraced Jones cause for canonization as an opportunity to convince a skeptical Protestant public of their compatibility, Catholicism's compatibility with American citizenship. In 1897, for example, Archbishop John Ireland of St. Paul proclaimed Joan the patron saint of patriotism, arguing that her life proved it was both possible and necessary for Catholics to love both country and church with undying affection. Now, of course, the causes of people who had actually, as historian John Gilmary Shea put it, people who had lived and died and consecrated themselves on American soil were even more valuable symbols of Catholics' love of country. Shea was actively involved in promoting the causes of René Goupil and Isaac Jogues, two Jesuit missionaries martyred in New France in the 1640s, along with Tequiquita, an indigenous woman who died in what became um, New York in 1680. This petition marked the first step ever taken in a cause for canonization from the United States. And it was sent from um, under the name of Archbishop of Baltimore, James Gibbons, later Cardinal, um, when the bishops met in Baltimore in 1884 on behalf of 
two Jesuits and uh, Tequiquita. Um, so just as Luigi uh, Gregori was painting his memorial, his murals at Notre Dame, it was these three holy people, like Columbus, who were used to show that Catholics had been in, in North America long before the United States existed, that they were not foreign, as many people alleged. Um, also, this idealization of the natural world, and particularly the frontier that was propelling St. Francis into popularity, these three holy people challenged the conception of Catholics as urban, as industrial. This was a perception fueled by the waves of new Catholic immigrants arriving on American shores in the late 19th century. Now later, uh, Jogues and Goupil were separated from Tequiquita and yoked instead to six of their confreres who had perished in the same decade, but in what became Canada. And they were kind of dubbed the North American martyrs. Um, my students and I are undertaking this semester a rather ambitious um, monument audit of Loyola Chicago's campus. We're trying to figure out who's represented and who isn't. Um, and of course, we're finding the North American martyrs are quite well represented, not only in Madonna della Strada, but also in the Kudahi Library with a, uh, that map that you see in the reading room, which was um, from really the year they were, were canonized, we think. But however robustly the North American martyrs are memorialized at Jesuit institutions like this one, they figure far less prominently in American memory more broadly. There's no Jesuit in the top 50. You didn't see two Franciscans and no Jesuit. Um, um, and this has to do for reasons of saints being perpetually reinvented. The martyrs were canonized at absolutely lightning speed by Vatican standards. Um, but that was an eternity when it came to the United States, a rapidly changing United States. By the time the martyrs were canonized, Euro-American Catholics were collectively wealthier, more powerful, and more distant from the immigrant past than the generation that had seen them as the quintessential American saints in the 1880s. And as a result, by the 1930s, US Catholics were gravitating to the saints who could help them tell a different American story, a story that embraced urban life and celebrated the ways that Catholics had embraced the nation rather than antedated it. So you find these amazing things, even in um, Jesuit publications like America, where say, well, yeah, yes, the martyrs are important, the Canadian martyrs or the North American martyrs, but none of them ever became citizens of the United States, which of course is anachronistic, but nonetheless telling. Even, even Jesuits like Leonard Feeney, now this is the same Leonard Feeney that would later be excommunicated, but that's a different story. Um, in the 1930s, he was a champion of um, uh, Catholics and Catholic integration into America. And in a homily he delivered at St. Patrick's Cathedral that was actually um, reported about in Time Magazine, he talked about the need, so this is in 1936, six years after the Jesuit martyrs were canonized, a need for an American saint taken right out of our midst, a saint who was a subject of our nation. Um, Feeney's favorite candidate was Elizabeth Ann Seton. He published a biography of her a couple years later. Um, but Seton and in fact all other candidates were just absolutely um, <laughs> leapfrogged by Francis Cabrini, um, who was canonized so very quickly that she required a special exemption from the rule that used to be in place that 50 years were needed to elapse between a saint's death and his or her canonization. Cabrini had only died in Chicago in 1917, and she was beatified in 1938 and canonized in 1946 as the first US citizen saint. Um, my class is going to the Cabrini Shrine later on um, this semester. We're very excited about that. Um, and this is, this is something that also captures this, this, the way we think about sanctity. This was dedicated, this mural was um, crafted by a Works Progress Administration um, artist. And it was reproduced for the 25th anniversary of Cabrini's death in 1942 with this quote from Cardinal Stritch about sanctity is not something that's away far off in a distant country, but here in the heart of this great metropolis. And it depicts Cabrini um, right there um, in the same conditions of life in which we live today. Now, um, we're going to move from the person who's considered to be America's first saint to the most recently canonized saint, the most recently canonized American saint, and that is Junipero Serra, who comes in at number 27 on our list. There's actually a fourth saint in the top 50 St. Paul, but he's not part of our story, so 
um, he's down here. <laughs> um, Sarah's high ranking is almost certainly owed to the fact, of, of, owed to his prominence in the history of the populist state of California. Um, there's a statue in the U.S. Capitol to him, a stamp, various other things. Um, Sarah died in 1787, um, and his cause was opened in 1930, in large part as a Franciscan rejoinder to the North American martyrs. They're like, if the Jesuits have a saint, we need one too. Um, congregational competition is a, is a serious thing when it comes to saints, among other things. Um, now, as an American hero, Sarah was subject to the same tribulations as Christopher Columbus. Um, there were protests at his beatification in 1988, and according to a 2002 memo I discovered in the Franciscan archives in Santa Barbara, congregational superiors had quietly decided to stop pursuing it. Not that they didn't think he was a holy person, but it just the, the, the protests were just too much. Provincial superiors were therefore as surprised as I was when Pope Francis announced in February 2015 that he would be canonizing Sarah on his visit to the United States the following September. That he did, and that marked the first canonization on U.S. soil. Um, canonizing saints in their home countries was implemented first by John Paul II, and although he had hoped to schedule the canonization of Philippine Duchenne in the United States in 1987, it didn't work out, um, so he never did that, but Francis did. His canonization drew widespread protest and continues to. Uh, so there are statues of him that are desecrated. Um, things are being renamed. We'll return to Pope Francis' what, what appears to be a unilateral decision on his part to canonize Sarah. But I want to use the story of another saint who featured prominently during his 2015 visit as a way to think about how saints' stories take on new meanings in new moments. I'm speaking now of Catherine Drexel, whose cause is worked on by my friend, um, Father Peter Gumpel, Gumpel. Drexel was beatified in 1988, the same year as Sarah, by John Paul II. In fact, she's the only American saint to be both beatified and canonized by John Paul II. He canonized her on October 1st, 2000. Born into a wealthy and philanthropic family in Philadelphia, Drexel developed a deep concern for the suffering of Native Americans and African Americans. And when she, went, when she met with Pope Leo XIII in, 19, in 1887, she pleaded that the Catholic Church do more to help those populations. Pope Leo turned it around. He said to her, what about you? What are you going to do? This led her on a journey of discernment, and in 1891, she founded the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and devoted her family's fortune to establishing educational and social services institution, um, institutions to serve Native Americans and African Americans throughout the United States including Xavier University in New Orleans, the only historically black Catholic university in the United States. Drexel died the same year as Teilhard de Chardin, and like him, was suggested as a saint for the times, only unlike in Teilhard's case, an official cause for canonization was opened by Drexel's congregation fairly quickly in 1964. Drexel's promoters emphasized her relevance in the age of Vatican II, citing her ecumenism and enrolling Protestants in her schools, the decision to name her congregation the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament as a way to, as a prefiguring the council proclamations about the Eucharist as the source and summit of Christian life. There was talk of proposing Drexel's sister and her husband as saints as well to reflect an emphasis on the laity. And Drexel's promoters, of course, tied her to the America of the 1960s and 70s, arguing that Drexel had in fact been prophetic in her crusade for racial justice building schools for black Catholics, subsidizing black churches, and promoting black vocations. Now, on this point, Drexel was indeed ahead of her time. The idea that people of color could be called to religious life was a principle that had been far from universally accepted when she founded the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament in 1891. Testimony from prominent African-American Catholics buttressed the case that Drexel was ahead of her time on race relations. The Reverend Augustine Tolton, the first openly black Catholic priest in the United States had told Drexel that, as I stand alone as the first Negro priest of America, so you stand alone as the first one to give your whole treasury for the sole benefit of the colored and Indians. Drexel's ovations also came from uh, more contemporary sources. In 1966, Judge Raymond Pace Alexander, the first black graduate of Wharton, argued that had U.S. Protestants been as enlightened as Drexel had been on the question of race, this is a quote from him, the bitter conflicts of the last century between the races, and more particularly the explosive events during the last decade, 
would never have taken place. These were all things that were on the top of my mind in September 2015 during Pope Francis's visit to the United States. I was serving as a commentator for NBC and MSNBC during the visit. And this picture here, which is really not that flattering of me, I'd love to show you like more glamorous ones where I'm like on the Today Show and all made up. This picture actually appeared on Bishop Robert Barron's Facebook page. And I want to set the scene. I'm sitting in between Robert Barron, director of Word on Fire, um, who was then auxiliary bishop, just been appointed auxiliary bishop in Los Angeles, and Chris Matthews, the host of MSNBC's Hardball. Interesting position to be in. But what's happening here, I'm actually really happy in this picture because in advance of the papal visit, uh, the, the Philadelphia leg of it, we were on location in Philadelphia. Pope Francis was arriving that Saturday morning to say mass. And, you know, you kind of, you can't really plan too much for TV, but you kind of can plan a little bit. And I thought, if I have an opening, I'm going to talk about Drexel because she's a native daughter and she needs attention. So Pope Francis beat me to the punch. What's happening here is I've just been handed an embargoed copy of his homily that Saturday morning. And it was all about Catherine Drexel. He started with that story between her and Pope Leo. What about you? What are you going to do? So I was very excited and also very grateful to Chris Matthews because he knew that I had written a lot about Drexel and he gave me the chance to talk about her. We talked about her at length. And at one point, though, I characterized her as a visionary leader. And this sent Chris Matthews off on a tirade about what he called the Catholic Church's woman problem. Now, I happen to agree with him on a lot of his points that he was making, but he wasn't talking about this woman problem in what I considered a, a particularly productive way. And so when I had an opening, Bishop Barron didn't touch it. He, he didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> but when I had an opening, I tried to provide some perspective. So I said, okay, yes, maybe the Catholic Church has a woman problem. But what's true of the Catholic Church is also true of most Fortune 500 companies, the U.S. military, most universities, law firms, national governments. The higher up the ranks of leadership, the lower the percentage of women. I also mentioned a passion of mine, women's invisibility in our national history. A few weeks before the papal visit, there had been a Republican primary debate. Now let's go back to September 2015. Remember, there were actually lots of candidates for the Republican nomination at that point. Um, but there was a debate in which the moderator asked all 10 participants which saint should replace Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill. This is Treasurer Rios, again, her effort. So here they are. The responses were stunning. One candidate suggested Mother Teresa. Admirable, not an American woman. <laughs> Another named Margaret Thatcher, also not an American woman. Mike Huckabee nominated his wife. Ben Carson suggested his mom. Carly Fiorina, the only woman on the stage, said she'd keep Hamilton. Most of the people on that stage, all of whom were running for the highest office in the land, could not name a historically significant American woman in the spare of the moment. Actually, it was Donald Trump who said Rosa Parks. He's the only one, yeah, believe it or not. Now, so anyway, back to my segment. I ended my little inter, inter, intervention with what I thought was an inspired idea. Catherine Drexel came from a banking family. She managed her inherited wealth very effectively, even as she dispersed it to improve the lives of a significant segment of the American population. Drexel was not only a holy hero, I said, but a national one. She belongs on the $10 bill. Someone tweeted it out. Case pros coming, says Catherine Drexel on the $10 bill. It was retweeted. I thought I had sparked a movement. And a few minutes later, within minutes, my, my phone buzzed with another notification. Case pros Cummings is a racist. And so was Catherine Drexel. Now, I knew immediately what the basis for this allegation was because it had surfaced in, in the testimony gathered in support of Drexel's cause for canonization. Drexel never admitted women of color into the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Those close to Drexel insisted that this refusal had stemmed not from racial prejudice, but from a desire to avoid distracting from the work of her congregation by sponsoring integrated convents in the South, and e an even stronger desire to support all black women's congregations, such as the Baltimore-based Oblate Sisters of Providence and the New Orleans-based Sisters of the Holy Family. This was corroborated in sworn testimony by Sister Juliana Haynes, an African-American woman who had been the first black woman accepted to the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and was serving as a superior by the time Drexel's cause was open. 
It was also echoed by, echoed by Sister Marie Infanta Gonzalez, then the Superior General of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, who had been educated by the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and had been directed by Drexel to the Oblates. Gonzalez said that the real and only reason that Drexel sent women of color to the Oblates was she didn't want to take away from them and also from the Sisters of the Holy Family. A canonization process, like a monument, only ever tells part of the story. What was missing from Drexel's canonization process were voices that told the story in a different way. Voices like that of Rosanna Heyman, who had written to Catherine Drexel in April 1936, asking to enter the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. I knew this because I came across Drexel's reply during my own research in Philadelphia's Archdiocesan Archives. In a letter dated April 19th, 1936, Catherine wrote to Rosanna, I am glad to know that our Lord has put into your heart the holy desire to consecrate your life to him. I am quite sure that if you write to Reverend Mother M. Quensuela, St. Francis Convent, Baltimore, Maryland, she will be able to help you. She is now the Mother General of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, an order now over 100 years old of colored nuns who have done magnificent work in the church and are still doing it. They have their novitiate in Baltimore and a number of girls just like yourself some of whom have been pupils in our schools. They have a very beautiful religious life. I had originally interpreted this letter simply as additional evidence of something I already knew, that Drexel routinely referred women to the Oblates. But then in June of 2020, a few days after George Floyd's murder, and in the midst of a search for another source, I happened upon this letter. And this time it hit differently. I thought more about how Rosanna felt. You don't belong with us, Drexel was saying to her. You belong with them. I have since used census and marriage records to piece together the scraps of information that Rosanna Heyman left in the historical record. She was born on July 22, 1916, to a white man, white man named William who worked at the Philadelphia Navy Yard and his Haitian-born wife, Molly. I don't know if Rosanna ever wrote to Mother Consuela, but I did ascertain that she married a Thomas LaHart in 1937, about one year after she received Drexel's rejection. By 1940, Rosanna and her two sons, who had been born in 1938 and 1939, were living with her parents and using her birth surname. I know that on April 26, 1997, Heyman wrote to Cardinal Anthony Bevilacqua in Philadelphia, asking to meet with him in connection with Drexel's cause for canonization. I know that an aide responded to that letter, but I don't know whether he or the Cardinal ever met with her. I know that Heyman died on January 16th, 2001, about three months after Drexel's canonization. If you could permit a theological diversion, and if you can't permit a theological diversion in the Teilhard de Chardin lecture, then when can you permit it? Um, I wanna say that um, one of the wonderful things about he being here at Loyola this semester is that my daughter Margaret is a senior here. And at family weekend a few weeks ago, my husband and Margaret and I heard a homily here by Father Paul Shelton, who was trying to characterize what a Jesuit education does that's distinctive. And he talked about four steps. Students are taught to take notice, encounter, imagine, and recreate and transform. And I really recognize this process in my relationship with Rosanna Heyman. When I first met her, when I first read that letter, I didn't pay her attention. And later in the midst of our national racial reckoning, I took notice, I made a decision to encounter her in different sources. I imagined what it was like to be her and felt compassion for a woman who had a call from God and who was unable to answer it, at least in part, because Catherine Drexel wasn't visionary enough. And so as a historian, we recreate Catherine Drexel's story by enlarging it. While the facts don't change, in light of new discoveries, the lives of long dead men and women take on new meaning and new moments. So I'm no longer spearheading a, moment to, a movement to put Drexel on the $10 bill. Um, but I believe more fervently than ever that she should be studied. On that note, I'm very grateful for the work of Shannon D. Williams, whose new book, Subversive Habits, probes Black Catholic sisters' struggles against institutionalized racism in the Catholic Church, including the systematic refusal of many white communities to admit women of color. I'll also note that my colleague Maggie McGinnis is publishing a biography of Drexel this spring with Paulus Press that is engaging these issues in Drexel's life. 
Speaking of Professor McGinnis, who teaches at LaSalle University, she sent me this headline the other day from the campus newspaper. Um, and I don't know, maybe I just feel guilty that I've talked so much about Franciscans and not enough about Jesuits that I want to take a slight at, a, a dig at a Franciscan university. But I love this, this headline because it not only spells St. Bonaventure's wrong, it talks about um, decanonization, which isn't a thing. We don't do that. <laughs> The Catholic Church canonizes people because they were holy, not because they were perfect. Um, and even if they were visionary in some respects, saints remain human beings who could not help but absorb the sinfulness of the worlds they inhabit. But remember, canonization's power has the power to enlarge and expand stories. So on that note, consider that Mary Elizabeth Lang, founder of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, is now um, her cause for canonization is now gaining momentum. In February 2020, writing in the Baltimore-based Afro News, local leaders Raph, Ralph Moore Jr. and Willie Flowers asked why, with all the issues, problems, and concerns in Baltimore City, why are some Marylanders devoting this Black History Month to a letter-writing campaign addressed to Pope Francis? The campaign is to, to declare Mother Mary Lang a saint, santo subito, sainthood now, by, by acclamation. And he talked about the ways that um, Mother Lang founded St. Francis Academy in Baltimore. And he said the fact that St. Francis has survived through the period of legal segregation and has, sustain, has been sustained through mass incarceration and mass poverty should be proof enough of Mother Lang's leadership and sainthood. If now is not the time for saint, uh, sainthood for Mother Lang, then when? Last spring, Woods expanded this movement into a petition on change.org to declare Lang and four other black Catholic saints by popular, um, and five other black Catholic saints by popular acclamation. Sainthood delayed, the petition states, is sainthood denied. This include people like Pierre Toussaint, who's in the upper corner here, um, uh, another uh, Haitian born um, prospective saint like Mary Lang, who um, was born into slavery and became a hairdresser in New York City and helped raise funds to erect St. Patrick's Cathedral where he is now buried. Um, I recently learned that Toussaint is um, going to be the subject of one of the New York Times overlooked obituaries where they go back and find published obituaries of people that should have gotten an obituary before. So another way, this is not just a Catholic project, this is an American project. Um, also pictured here is um, Father Augustus Tolton here in Chicago. Um, just yesterday, <laughs> some of my students and I, this is my students at the Cardinal Meyer Center on the South Side, um, where Tolton ministered as a priest and very near the site where he collapsed from heat exhaustion and later died. We went, met with Bishop Joseph Perry of Chicago, who is the postulator of Tolton's cause. Um, and he talked to us about Tolton's significance about his story and about what his story can teach us. A story of a prospective saint who was also born into slavery, who had a call to become a priest, but whom no seminary in the United States would accept. So who had to study, travel to Rome to be ordained, to study and be ordained there. Tolton's story is an opportunity to learn about institutionalized racism in the, racism in the church, and also an opportunity to embrace anti-racism. This is the message of Chloe Becker's mural in which Tolton and Thea Bowman, another one of the six black Catholic saints, prospective saints, are featured along with already named African saints. Ms. Becker painted this mural as a high school junior inspired by her own lack of knowledge of African saints and also by the USCCB's pastoral letter on racism. She consciously modeled the saints on real people, parishioners at St. Adalbert's in Cleveland and dressed them in modern day clothing. Chloe wanted to paint a mural. She thought it was important to anchor it into place and it remains at her high school in Cleveland. But um, in this age of digitization, it has been reproduced widely. I discovered it for the first time on the website of Campus Ministry at Loyola, Maryland as part of an effort to embrace social justice there. Um, you may have heard um, Loyola, Maryland captured national attention when it renamed one of its residence halls uh, that had been named for Flannery O'Connor in honor of Thea Bowman for some of the same kinds of issues that I spoke about with Drexel. Um, Chloe's mural, I just love it. Um, these constellations here are all tied to um, Greek gods representing areas where um, African-Americans have suffered the most from systemic racism in areas of wealth, in um, education, in healthcare, and criminal justice. 
So in terms of moving forward, in terms of American saints, um, where do we go? Um, counting Isaac Jogues and Randy Gapil, and they do count an official list of American saints, um, there are presently 12 canonized saints who died within the present day boundaries of the United States. Who is next? At last count, and I try to keep a fairly close count on these things, but it's, it's hard. There are over 90 people, 90 Americans who are at some stage in the process, um, some stage of the process. And among them, who is next? I just want to talk about a few of them. I think um, a few ways to think about who is going to be next. Um, the first uh, point is that representation matters. And so I think one or more of these six black Catholic saints are going to be propelled forward. I also think this is true in the case of Native Americans like Black Elk. Now, Black Elk, Pierre Toussaint, and Julia Greeley, another of the Black Catholic saints, form a subset of a constituency that is in short supply among American saints, and that specifically is lay leaders. Um, probably the most prominent saint in the making who is a lay leader is Dorothy Day. Um, my students and I read a, a wonderful article by Paul Eli, and published in 1998 that talks about Day as the uh, patron saint of paradox and the way that when Cardinal O'Connor announced her cause in 1992, he characterized her as the patron saint of, prospective patron saint of women who have had abortions and regretted them. And the way that led to concerns about Day's story being appropriated in ways that didn't present her authentically. I think there's less concern about that now as her cause has advanced and certainly in the age of Pope Francis. Dorothy Day had been inspired to establish the Catholic worker movement when she was reading the life of Rose Hawthorne Lathrop, the daughter of author Nathaniel Hawthorne and founder of a congregation of Dominican sisters dedicated to Rose of Lima. In her biography, Day recounted reading that Hawthorne had started a chain of cancer hospitals in a four room tenement such as the one I was living in and wondering why not start a newspaper the same way? I mention Rose because I think if increasing representation is one path um, to, to discerning who the next saints will be, a second is, is what I call saints who kind of match the moment in some way. So uh, Hawthorne is not widely known, but, um, but the way that her, she founded a congregation devoted to the care of the indigent poor. And her congregation has smaller, is much smaller now, but they still accompany people close to death. And she's been characterized as the patron saint of, of the, host, the mother of the modern hospice movement. And I think that's something we don't do very well in our church or, or nation is, is help people die well. And so I think that's a, that's a, if I were her postulator, which I'm not, um, I, that's what the argument that I would make. And she also does get attention. Um, her congregation gets attention in secular um, publications as well. I also, you know, when I did my research at the Hawthorne Dominicans, I, I had a quiet moment by, um, Rose's gravesite, and she's buried next to her dear friend Alice Huber, who also became a sister, and they they work together. And I thought about the ways that these saints' cause get bundled, you know, usually by martyrdom. And I thought, what if we could bundle saints' causes by friendship, people working together in common causes? I think that's something I, I think is just a, a wonderful way to, to think about it. Um, another potential uh, uh, saint is um, Dorothy Stang a sister of Notre Dame Dana Muir, who, um, as you can tell, has been called the martyr of the Amazon. She was murdered on February 12th, 2005, after having been warned many in Brazil, after having been warned many times by um, Afri um, loggers in the Amazon to cease and desist from her efforts to stop their efforts. And uh, she was met by hired guns on her way home from a meeting in the Amazon, held up her Bible as her only weapon and was gunned down. Then um, she is a Laudato Si saint, surely. And I think um, there's a lot. Um, I guess Teilhard de Chardin can too. He made it into, into there in a footnote. Um, but I think she's another one that really matches the moment. Um, here's a mural depicting her again uh, with some of the, the people from Brazil who are known as the rainforest, the martyrs of the rainforest. I think another um, person who has certainly gotten a lot of attention, particularly last year with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is Michael Judge, um, the Franciscan, oh gosh, there's another Franciscan, um, uh, firefighter who is officially listed as the first victim 001 um, at Ground Zero on September 11th. This um, was a, an iconic photo widely compared to the Pieta. And um, Michael, 
uh, was an openly gay priest, and he has become a bit of a of a of a holy hero among um, the LGBT community. So I think he's another saint that matches the moment. Uh, another, a third way that I think we need to think about this is in terms of demographic diversity. Um, Dorothy Day, Pierre Toussaint, Michael Judge, Rose Hawthorne. Um, New York has a stranglehold on um, official sanctity. And I realized as I was writing this that it might have something to do with the fact that it's October and I'm a Phillies fan married to a Yankees fan. And I just, I just have a problem with New York. But I will also say that Philadelphia also has two saints, Catherine Drexel and John Newman. And I think it's time to, to think about expanding the canon of the American saints in ways that represent our demography. I actually think Francis' decision to canonize Unipo Serra, I did and I, I, I don't know this for sure, had to do with what, it, what was his desire to incorporate the Southwest and Western part of the United States into his trip. If you recall, Francis visited because he was fulfilling a pledge made by Pope Benedict to attend the World Meeting of Families, which was in Philadelphia. And I think if Francis could have designed his own itinerary for his first trip, he would have gone to other places in the United States, probably not the Northeast. So I think causes such as those attached to Carlos, Carlos Rodriguez of Puerto Rico or the New Mexican native and Sacramento Bishop Alphonse Gallegos are also ways that we can make it more in inclusive. These are just a few of those that have causes or, or something close to it. Um, I want to uh, just end by entering the realm of speculation. So maybe I really want to be a science fiction novelist after all. Um, no, not, not really. There are clues. I think of Father Ted Hesburgh preaching at the funeral of Patty Crowley, saying that Pat and Patty Crowley could become the first married couple to be canonized a saint um, from the United States. I also, um, thanks to my student Christina Paget, who is here tonight, um, I also was made aware of a second saint, of a, a third sainthood petition originating from Baltimore, very different from the Black Catholic one, and certainly very different from the 1884 one in U.S. bishops. This is proposing on change.org again that a cause for canonization be, canonization be initiated for Sister Kathy Chesnick, Catholic nun who was murdered in a still unsolved case. It's rumored that her murder was connected to her efforts to expose clerical sexual abuse of young girls at the high school which she taught. This petition suggests that opening a cause on behalf of Sister Kathy would be a sign that the church recognized the suffering caused by sexual abuse and be prepared to shine a light on and therefore atone for its mistakes. It's unlikely that the Archdiocese responded. I know Christina tried to find that out. And it's also unlikely that this will ever come to be. But it's important as a historical source, um, not only because it testifies to the turmoil caused by the ongoing revelations in the sex abuse crisis, but also because it provides a clue, I think, of who will be canonized in the future. I think it will be the heroes, um, the people who tried to enact change, many of whom were women, um, who tried to stand up to this. It also speaks to who won't be canonized. Fulton Sheen's the cancellation of his beatification a few years ago um, because of an allegation that he had, as Bishop of Rochester, had been involved in cover-up, I think makes it very unlikely that any man who served in high office in the Catholic Church in the final third of the 20th century will ever be proposed as a saint because the risk is, is, is there that something will be uncovered. This is an argument to bring back the 50-year rule Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II changed it to five years. And I think we need to let historians do their work when it comes to causes for canonization. So that's a little bit of the who. Um, why Why canonization? Um, there, is, there are folk saints. There are people saints. There are people who say, Michael Judge is a saint to me. I don't need the Catholic Church to tell me he's a saint. But acknowledgement still matters. They see this very clearly in the case of the Black Catholic prospective saints, all of whom have been revered as people saints in their local communities since their deaths. But there's a sense of validation, of recognition that the Catholic Church would, would acknowledge them as part of the church. Canonization is an ecclesial process and remains so, but is there a way to give more power to the people of God in this process? And that's a question I wanna end with. Um, the question of how. Um, perhaps echo Ken Woodward in his book, Making Saints, when he asks, quoting John Coleman, SJ, what happens when formal canonization procedures no longer give us the saints we need? Have we arrived at that moment? I think in some ways it's the unfinished promise of Vatican II. Um, the council's commitment to collegiality um, did lead Cardinal Sunins of Belgium to suggest that the Roman center should not have as much authority over naming saints as it had for the past three centuries. He suggested that the church revert to its former practice of allowing local bishops to beatify saints while leaving the final stage of canonization to the Bishop of Rome. 
there was some movement in that, but along came Pope John Paul II, who streamlined the process and did make it more accessible in some ways, but he also centralized it in ways um, that, uh, that I don't think are fully understood. Um, he increased the papal role in beatification. Popes did not used to provide it, preside at beatifications. And he also became more aggressive in pushing saints' causes forward, actually going to the congregation saying, find me a saint. He tried to do that with Philippine Duchenne in 1987. Now, um, Pope Francis, um, John Paul II canonized uh, more people than all of his predecessors combined. Pope Francis has already canonized almost twice as many people as Pope John Paul II. As of last Sunday morning, he canonized 911 people. That's a little misleading because he canonized 813 martyrs of Otranto um, in one fell swoop in um, 2013. Nevertheless, I think in the case of Pope Francis, um, who wrote in Gaudate at Exultate about national bishop conferences, which signaled a sign that, that he might want to restore more power to the local church. But he's also showing more of a tendency, I think, to kind of handpick saints, as he did with Sarah. So I, I wonder, as we think about the synod um, and synodality and sanctity, is there a way to give the people more of a say and more of a say in who moves forward? I guess I'm asking, can canonization remain ecclesial while at the same time becoming less clerical? That's a question I don't know the answer to, but I think it's essential to expanding the canon of the saints to more accurately uh, resemble the church. I'm going to give the last word to Dorothy Day. Um, we often hear um, her quoted on the subject of saints, um, the one that gave its title to this documentary, which my students get a kick out of, The Smoking Saint, um, which is great. Um, she is said to have said, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be so easily dismissed. But one of my favorite quotes from Dorothy Day comes from a letter she wrote to Gordon Zahn in 1968. She said, I never expected leadership from the popes and bishops. All throughout history, it is the saints that keep appearing who keep things going. And so I'll just end by wondering, at this moment in our church and nation, if the saints can't save us, then who can? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cummings, for that excellent lecture. We are so nourished by it. Um, I know there's plenty of people who will likely have a comment or a question. And so the floor is yours, crowd. Um, Katie's over there. So please just raise your hand and we'll uh, circulate the microphones. It's always so awkward. Thank you, Dr. Peter Gilmore. <laughs> Thank you for that very informative lecture. It was good to hear some uh, former professors Loyola being mentioned in there, Cardin Zahn being one of them. Yes. Um, when Pope Francis came to America and spoke before the Congress, he upheld four people as great models. And uh, two of them were Catholic, two of them weren't Catholic, Dorothy Day being one, Thomas Merton being the other. Uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the top, yeah, the, the two, yeah, two and of the I'm top. Wondering how how you look at that kind of perhaps we could call it a secular canonization mm -hmm. or an informal canonization, mm -hmm. or just put your reflections on his holding those particular four people up for admiration. Well, I thought it was wonderful. I was also commenting on NBC during it. So in real time, I was trying to, to parse this out. I mean, I think um, I think it was it, we knew he was going to, to lift some Americans up and, and we didn't or at least I didn't know who. And I think the choice of um, Lincoln and Martin Luther King is, is, you know, they're two of the most widely represented people in our history. Dorothy Day was really heartening, um, in particular because I did know the, the fears about her appropriation as, um, or the way that her life with canonization ran the risk of being reduced to a woman who had an abortion and regretted it when she was so much more. And the way Pope Francis talked about her, um, I, I think was was really wonderful. Now for this, this lecture, I mean, you know, for canonization in the Catholic Church, you have to 
have existed, number one. Um, that wasn't always the case, but um, you have to be dead um, and you have to be Catholic, you know? And so I think um, when we think about a new kind of saint and others, um, theologically speaking, have talked about expanding canonization beyond Catholicism. Um, that's, that's not, uh, in being tied to the process, that's not what I did, but I think there's absolutely room for that. And yes, I mean, the way we, saints are, are people that, Canonized saints are people that the church has singled out as heroes. And we do that in all sorts of ways, by putting people on stamps, by putting them on buildings, um, by, in Pope Francis' case, lifting them up before the joint session of Congress. So yes, I think it is, it is a way to name a saint, um, not officially, but certainly, certainly unofficially. So yeah, I thought it was a wonderful moment. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Mary Kate Holman uh, uh, at Indiana University. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, thank you for this really fascinating talk. Um, I'm I'm really intrigued by that quote that you ended with, with Dorothy Day, kind of saying more or less it's, it's not the people in charge, it's the things <laughs> that are showing up. Because in a sense, to be canonized as saint is to be recognized by the ecclesial institution, and so many of the saints that you've talked about, and even ones that you can explicitly name in this. Um, in this dynamic, like Joan of Arc, persecuted by the mm -hmm. church. I mean, obviously, our talking about people like Tay are persecuted by the church. So, I'm wondering if you can comment on um, kind of the the institutional reclaiming of mm -hmm. people who were persecuted by the institution without the institution ever recognizing that. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, well, what that says about mm -hmm. what it means to be a Catholic. State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, all at St. Francis of Assisi, too, somebody who, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that is an argument for, um, so I, we're very impatient. Uh, I think of um, what Teilhard said about, about patience, and, um, and I think as Americans, we, you know, I mean, sainthood now, look at that petition, but like now, Santo Subito, by the way, they, they were signs that were held up at John Paul II's funeral in 2005, um, canonized him immediately, um, which Pope Benedict did not do, although he did waive the five-year process and, and the, or the five-year requirement and opened the cause 11 days after his death. But yeah, we want it now. And I think there are ways, like, I think there should be an intermediate way to kind of recognize the saints of the moment. But I think, yeah, how can we, how can, it, it's, it takes the church a long time to, to recognize what sanctity is. And sometimes that's people who, who spoke out against the church. I think we're gonna see that in, in sex abuse as, um, very clearly, I don't know when. I think Michael Judge will become a canonized saint. I don't think it will be anytime soon. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good question and it's a little bit of a, of a conundrum. Um, how do you name saints that speak to the moment but that also make room for, for this expansion of historical knowledge that inevitably comes? So yeah, it's a good question. I don't have a good answer, but I think that's, that should be a conversation um, in terms of synodality. How do we, how do we, th who, who gets to, who gets the influence? I mean, even talking to Bishop Perry yesterday, which was wonderful, but you know, but like he's a bishop and we asked him, we said, did you talk to Pope Francis about him? He said, no, I've never talked to Pope. I said, well, gosh, if he never talked to Pope Francis about him, how are people like us going to talk to, you know, I mean, you do need people who are in positions of power to move it forward um, at this stage. So yeah, great question. So I just wanted to piggyback on that because you, I was interested in your comments about no church leaders from the last third of the 20th century, mm -hmm. but then you just gave an example of not the American church leader, but John Paul II. So yeah. what do you think about the, what's kind of becoming the automatic canonization of all popes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what I think about it is is actually what I said um, after the McCarrick report came out on... Um, uh, it wound up being on the front page of the New York Times, a quote from me saying, John Paul II was canonized too fast. Um, the vitriol that I got, I'll just leave you to imagine it. And, you know, one person wrote to me and said that he had never heard such hatred expressed toward a pope before. And against my better judgment and my common practice, I wrote back to this person. And I said that I clarified what canonization is. And I said, canonization is about us. It's not about, it's about a statement of who, and I said, you know, God does the judging, you know. God. Um, by saying he's too, it was canonized too fast, what I'm saying is that if he didn't have a cause for canonization opened so soon, he probably would not have had it. I don't think his cause for canonization would be open after McCarrick 
And after everything else, we're going to find out. I think that doesn't mean I don't think he dwells in God's eternal presence. That's not my. Um, that's not for me to say. I mean, it's not for any of us to say. So I do think, um, yeah, I do think we are going to see a change. I think we're going to see a resistance to that automatic canonization and perhaps just giving more time, um, to, again, to let historians do their work. This is the case of, you know, Pope Pius XII as well. Peter Gumpel was his, he oversee that cause. And um, I don't think historians have gotten in those Vatican archives yet. We just don't know. We don't know so much. So, yes, I, I think we're going to see a trend against it. Uh, hi, I'm Casey. Um, I'm a master's student here at Loyola. Hi. Um, I wanted to, you mentioned the institution of canonization in the 16th century and towards the end talking about sort of how we understand the process of canonization and perhaps changes to that. Um, I'm curious if at all you see potentially a return to some of those like medieval, like local saints mm -hmm. or saint cults or kind of this where the becoming of a saint seems to be more rooted in the the congregation and the peoples, um, mostly because there's a really process in place, but yeah. um, this reality of these cults of saints and these local saints that perhaps aren't more largely recognized, but in these communities are truly these, these heroes, these saints that you've spoken to. Yeah, I think we need a mechanism for that in within the context of the church uh, as, as well, a way to do that. I think that's exactly what, what, I'm, what I, I think would be good, a way to have some kind of um, something that's more quick, that speaks more powerfully to the moment and allows, but also has some kind of affirmation by the church because that acknowledgement is important. Um, there, are, there are lots of, um, Santa Morte, we, we talk, there are lots of un, unofficial saints, the people saints, the folk saints, who are never going to have a process. They don't need a process. You even see that with some of the, the women, Dorothy Stang and certainly the, the four church women murdered in El Salvador. Some of their congregations say, we don't need a process. We know they're saints. I guess um, why I still think there should be a longer process is that canonization does, for everything that's, that's tedious about it, it is permanent. I mean, once you're in, unless, again, you know, like you were proved to not have existed, like, you know, or based on myth or something, you're there, you know, there are churches named after you there. Are. So I just think with the people saints, you need to keep them alive in, in, in memory and, and can, in historical memory and canonization accomplishes that. So I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm open to ideas. I don't know if Pope Francis is open to ideas, but I think he should be. Again, I mean, I, th I think he's, he's been quite centralized about it in a way that is at odds with some of his other statements. So I'd love to hear your ideas. Thanks, everybody. We're looking at six or seven minutes, um, so we'll be efficient. But over here, please. Oh, um, do you think that the bias, the sort of increasing bias towards quickness, is a reflection of the American influence in the church? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Lord Saint died in 1481, <laughs> right. so it took a while, but this 11 day process of this three year process, is yeah. that um, a reflection of increasing? Well, Americans definitely have more influence than they, they used to. Um, uh, for sure, um, that. But you know, in Italy, also, I'm thinking of the canonization of Carlo Acutis, um, the first millennial saint who was canonized. Uh, sorry, he was beatified maybe two years ago, um, and he, you know, he was he's shown wearing like was it Nikes or something like his sneakers, you know. And he was talking to people as like the first millennial saint to kind of you know capture millennials and, and maybe reverse the trend of millennials leaving the church. I don't know how successful that would be, but that's the so. Um, yeah, I think, but I think a large part of it has to do with American impatience and this idea that that we live in a Americans live in a, a, a culture that changes very rapidly, and then canonization occurs over decades and and most likely centuries. Thank you. I wanted to uh, let the Zoom nation speak a little bit here, just <laughs> give you uh, samples. There's several questions. Here's um, a sampling. So, Kathy, just maybe you, you can pick a couple things up on this. Uh, has the digital age ushered in a greater departure? Or are there surprising similarities in the ways in which a cause can be advanced in the role of a lady in the process? Um, this person is citing um, martyrdom that you mentioned. She first says um, it's a fantastic discussion. Uh, but she also, you know, in that regard, cites Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, um, people like that. Another one is um, how do we honor people's contributions and still recognize their shortcomings? 
Mm -hmm. um, how do we increase space for nuance in this increasingly polarized society? Which makes us think of your quote, you know, um, the same canonizes people not because they're perfect, but because they're holy. But, mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that before we go back? That's to a, that was a lot. That was a yeah, lot of questions lot right for, now. yeah, yeah. I mean, digitization, yeah. I mean, I think it does have the power to amplify stories. I mean, change.org, like, you know, I mean, that's that's a new mode. I think about it in terms of sources as a historian, too, just how, how would we ever collect all the writings of a prospective saint from this age, um, you know, in the future? It just kind of boggles boggles the mind um, in terms of that. Nuance, I think it's just, it's adding layers. I mean, I, you know, I spoke very personally about, about Catherine Drexel, a person who I still consider a, a holy person, a, 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 but yet coming to understand her in a new way, not to condemn or cancel her in any way, but to add these other, to enlarge her story. So I think nuance is, is you know, I mean, this is not a conversation to be had on Twitter, um, uh, but it's only through, you know, more scholarship, more attention. So, yeah. Thanks for your question. Your comment a moment ago, Kathy, about the naming of churches. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about this. So I don't know if other archdioceses are going through the same process, but here in Chicago, we're going through a process that the Cardinals called Renew My Church, which basically means unification or closing or joining of yeah. different parishes and part of that process is each new parish selects a name for itself um and i i would be curious what are the names that are being put forth and in mm -hmm. our church the the christians are making the nominations and okay. it it would be interesting to see who's in that group and who appears in multiple lists of nominations, and what does that say about the present moment and who we are looking for or naming for ourselves as examples of holiness for our present time? That would be fascinating. Uh, we're running up against the the provision, but the, w one of the things that the point of beatification and canonization is beatification permits public veneration on a local level, and canonization permits it on a universal level. So you actually can't name a church or any public site after someone who hasn't been canonized. So, I mean, maybe that's a way to, to name a church after a saint in the making, possibly. I don't know, but that would be fascinating to see who are the people suggesting. Yeah. Hi, that was spectacular. Because I, I, I was very moved by your story, as a his fellow historian, by the research that you did uh, around that incident with uh, Catherine Drexel. That was extremely powerful story, a historian story. <laughs> I, have, I want to connect these two questions, which I really, really loved about Santo Subito. And so, you know, John Paul II, whatever, whatever he did with the character, what he did with Masia was unbelievable. <laughs> Just unbelievable, right? It was, it was evil. Uh, and so I wonder if, if with that, we raise the question of Canonization as a way of silencing or curtailing further lines of inquiry and discussion in the church. So that you know, now that he's a saint, what what do we say about the Masiel mm -hmm. stuff? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's almost as if a, it's almost as if a language has been mm -hmm. the language has been cut off to speak about Masiel now in re, in relation to this mm -hmm. figure mm -hmm. who is canonized mm -hmm. for Catholics. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I guess I'll just I'll just say that the canonization, as I've thought about it, is additive, right? So we don't we don't we don't de we don't decant, but we add. So in that you know in that mural we have Thea and Augustus adding, and I think about people whose names actually maybe you're writing about some of them who were the survivors of clerical sexual abuse, their, their courage, their are they the ones who will have a cause open for them? That they, we can name buildings after them and not St. John Paul II. We do have, canonization is not the final word, I guess. It seems like the final word because it's like really official in the banners in, in, you know, in St. Peter's, but it doesn't have to be the final word. And in adding and telling other kinds of stories and including in the story of John Paul II, all these other stories. A biography published of him um, 50 years from now is not going to look like a 
the, the testimonials today, even though he is a canonized saint. It might matter, seem to matter to us, but it's not going to matter as much in the long run, I hope. With that, um, please join me in thanking Dr. Cummings for a truly uh, scholarly and nourishing. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you.